Is this the perfect Greek grammar? Well, in this video, we're going to answer that exact question. So, stay tuned, let's get into it. During 2020, we saw a couple of brand new Greek grammars being released. One of them was, of course, this one by Dr. Merkel and Plummer, beginning with New Testament Greek. But toward the end of the year, we also saw this grammar by Dana Harris released. Now, this grammar... I received a number of uh, requests from people like you, people who watch this channel, who were asking, when am I going to review this grammar? Now, this only came out, I think it was in uh, October. I think it was October. Uh, so it's only been out a couple of months. And so, but even so, I've got a lot of requests for it. So, so with this video, we're going to review this grammar. We're going to talk about what's in it. We're going to talk about what I like about it. We're going to talk about perhaps some of the things that may be improved. And we're going to answer the question, is this the perfect Greek grammar. And perhaps you already know the answer to that question because really there is no such thing as a perfect Greek grammar. But personally, I think this is probably the grammar that comes the closest of all the grammars that I've reviewed so far. Let's find out why. So the first thing you'll find about this grammar is that it's very, very well written. Perhaps of all of the grammars that I have read, the writing in this grammar is very lucid, very clear, um, it's not overly long, but yet it's not too short. It's succinct, but provides a good amount of information. And I think this is a really good balance. I think one of the things Danny Harris has tried to do is provide very clear descriptions of what she's talking about, particularly for beginning Greek students. And I think she succeeded in this grammar. This is very, very well written. And this comes out really in a couple of areas in her approach to certain things. For instance, when it comes to the middle voice, Rather than treating the middle voice with passive tense forms, which is what most grammars will do, she treats the middle voice with the active tense form. Now, why is that significant? Well, you might think that that's going to introduce uh, new things for them to learn during the active voice, new morphology to learn. And yeah, you'd be right. That's true. There are some new things to learn. But the benefit of it is that you don't get confused thinking that the middle voice and the passive voice belong together. Just because they are morphologically doesn't mean they are from a meaning point of view. And that's one of the things that comes out really well. By putting the middle voice with the active voice, you actually avoid the confusion around is this passive in meaning or is this active in meaning? And she's arguing very clearly, I think, in this grammar that you can think of from an English reader's point of view, you can think of the middle voice as being the equivalent of an English active verb, but with some specific nuance, i.e. focusing on the subject, okay, which is exactly what the Greek middle voice does. So I think this is a really helpful approach to the middle voice, even though it may prove a little bit more challenging for learners as they start into the learning process. Another area in this grammar that, the, that Dana Harris has done a great job of explaining material in a clear and lucid way is when it comes to principal parts and the stems, the different stems and roots that come with verbs. The chapter that deals with this is very clear and even has, I think, a really helpful uh, diagram of a tree, which I don't recall seeing in any other grammars, where you have the root of the tree, then you have the branches, which are the different stems, and then she explains how the different stems relate to the root, and so on and so forth. And the, the explanation of this is just really clear, one of the best I've seen anywhere. So again, this is Probably, of all the grammars that I've ever read, this is probably the most lucidly and clearly written, which I think is well worth having just for that alone. Now, the probably the next competitor to that would be Rodney Decker's Reading Koine Greek, which was, I think, until this grammar came along, probably my favorite. Uh, I think this is going to supplant that, though. Hey there, are you enjoying the review of this? If you are, could you hit the like button down below? That would be really helpful. Thanks very much. When you know, if you've been watching my videos for a little while, not only am I looking for a good pedagogical approach within the grammar, and we'll talk about that again in a little bit more, because I think if anything puts a little blemish on this, I think there is one or two areas in that area, but we'll come back to that. One of the things that I'm always looking for is how they approach the language generally. Like, how are they looking at it from the point of view of the latest research, from the point of view of verbal aspect, particularly deponency, and things like that. And you can find videos that have already written on deponency and verbal aspect on this channel. I'll leave a link in the description below. You can find those there, and you might even find one just up here as well. This is the first grammar on the market that uses the Grammar Translate method that presents the two-aspect approach to verbal aspect. Now, first of all, 
a lot of grammars don't even in, in really talk about verbal aspect in the first year grammar. This one does. And not only that, it teaches the two aspect view, which is Constantine Campbell's view of it as well, which I think is the best explanation for what's actually going on in the language. Now, you might be tempted to say to me, well, wait a minute, what about Constantine Campbell's and Richard Gibson's grammar? Isn't that the first one that does the two aspect view? Well, yes, it's the first grammar to do the two aspect view, but that doesn't use the grammar translate method. That uses the a, a different a prepare practice and present approach, which is slightly different in its approach, which accounts for why that grammar is a little bit shorter. This grammar is a traditional grammar translate method approach, and it is the only one that I'm aware of that's actually using the two aspect view. So that makes this a little bit unique. It also sets it apart from even the likes of Ronnie Decker's reading Koine Greek, which again was one of my favorites up to this point, which uses the three state view, which has the state of aspect in the perfect tense form. This does not do that. This takes the perfect tense form and regards it as the imperfective aspect, which with, with a heightened proximity, which I think is the, the best explanation for why the author would have chosen a perfect or pluperfect for that, for that matter when it comes to remoteness uh, tense form. And for more information about that, you can find a link to that in the uh, video that I'll leave a link to just up in the description box up here. Now, along with that goes the idea that time is not part of the tense form in the indicative or in any other mood, but is actually part of the context. So the context indicates the time of the verb, not the verb form itself. So you don't have this argument that says that the imperfect tense form or the aorist tense form is a verb that normally takes place in the past. No, she explains very clearly that the aorist tense form, for example, could refer to an event that takes place in the past, in the present or even in the future and she explains why using verbal aspect and which is again the best explanation for why the the language is structured the way it is at least in my view now a flow-on effect of the of the argument that there is no time in the indicative is that we have to rethink the way we talk about the augment and Dana Harris does this really well rather than arguing that the augment indicates what is a verb that is normally in the past she's arguing along with Rodney Decker and reading Koine Greek that the augment goes with the secondary tense endings and the secondary tenses themselves which is a far better explanation and makes more sense and is more consistent with the way the verbs have been used so again no time in the indicative the augment goes with the ending or the te secondary tenses not with time at all and we have verbal aspect explaining how the verbs are actually being used and there's no time in the indicative. So I like the approach in this grammar. I think this is the, the best approach for helping students to understand how the, the words, the verbs particularly, are actually working. Now, speaking of structure and speaking of verbs at the same time, this is one of those grammars that like beginning with New Testament Greek as well, and there's a number of other grammars that do this now as well, uh, starts off by teaching the student uh, verbs, right? So the first chapter where you're really talking about grammar is the present tense form. And, and the benefit of that is that in the Greek sentence, the, the finite verb is the center of the clause, right? Everything works around that main verb. So if you don't understand the main verb, you're really struggling to understand how the sentence is structured. I think this is one of the downsides of Mounts' Basics of Biblical Greek, is that you learn verbs much later. Of course, you can learn it a little earlier if you take track two. But for the most part, you're learning it later, which means that you don't have a very full understanding of how verbs work and therefore how the different pieces work around the verbs. And I think this is a strength of Harris and uh, Plummer and Merkel and Rodney Decker and a lot of these other grammars. They will all do the same thing. They'll teach verbs right up front because they know that you need to know the verb to understand the sentence. And this unlocks the language very early on. So this is another benefit, I think, of this grammar as well. In addition to putting verbs first, the structure of the chapters themselves is actually really well thought out as well. At the end of each chapter, you have a review. Normally, it's about a half-page review of what we talked about in this particular chapter, which again, just helps to consolidate the concepts that you've just been going through, which can be overwhelming. But here's a review, here's a summary, just a few things you need to know. And then, and this is really helpful, I think, you have a study guide, which is basically saying, this is what you need to know to be able to be confident to go on to the next chapter, which is really good. So again, well structured in terms of, a, from a pedagogical perspective as you go through. In terms of vocabulary, you're gonna learn about 600 words when you go through this grammar, uh, and that might 
for a beginning Greek grammar, that's pretty aggressive. But I think this is a good pace. It works out to about 25 words pretty consistently in every chapter except for the four integration chapters. Now, let me talk about these integration chapters. There are four sections, four chapters in this that are designed to really just go back over the last seven or eight verse, uh, chapters that you've been through and talk about and consolidate what you've learned there. Now, each of these integration chapters also includes a different kind of exercise. I'm gonna talk about the exercise in just a minute. These exercises are more like an exegesis class, a kind of a mini exegesis class where you're trying to work out what is like, say, for instance, what is the direct object of the verb in this set of verses that I give you? Uh, and the set of verses, it's not really a set of verses, it's more like a, a, a text, if you like, that's compiled from different passages throughout the New Testament. Uh, but this is a great way, again, of just identifying the different parts, what you've learned, how they're working, and really consolidating what you know in a different way to what you would normally do through the just a plain old translation. So this is really interesting. And I think this would be worth exploring as well. The other thing about this is that if you're teaching this in a classroom environment, you can actually take these and turn them easily into either a midterm or a final exam as well, which makes these really, really good. So these are kind of interesting. I'm curious to explore them a little bit more. But let's talk about some of the things that I'm a little less excited about. And this really comes down to two key areas, I think. The first one is that as you start the grammar, the quantity of information, particularly in chapter two, I think can be a little over, could be a little overwhelming for a student. But I don't think this is necessarily a killer for the whole grammar. Basically, you've got a number of ways of managing this. You could say to your students, either skim this chapter and then move on to the next one, or, and this is what my preference would probably be, would be to take that material and then distribute it, drop it through the course as you're going so that you get them to go back to that chapter and reread it. And of course, you could do both of those. Skim this chapter and we're going to readdress all that material as we need it as we go through this course. So those are that's one way of doing it. But I think that that second chapter, chapter two, where she talks about just like a, uh, the Greek verb from a 30,000 foot view, is probably a little overwhelming. And the problem is that students coming into this from scratch have no idea about how the language works or anything like that, which is of course why you've got this chapter, but they've got no hooks to mount those things on to be able to use them and recall them later on. So I think this is probably one of those chapters that's probably helpful, particularly for reviewing this a second time. Like if you're refreshing your Greek or something, great chapter for you if you're refreshing. But if you're coming at the Greek and the grammar for the first time, this chapter is the sort of chapter I would say either just skim it and we'll talk about it as we go through, or I would just say skip it and we'll talk about it as we go through. And the other thing with this chapter is that the students really want to get into translation really quickly. And there's no exercise, no translation exercise, at least for this chapter, which means, you, again, you're trying to hook these ideas onto things that the student just doesn't have in mind yet. So this is one of the challenges. The other thing about this grammar that I think is, well, it's not really the grammar that's the issue. Really, it comes down to this workbook. The workbook itself, you know, I'm not a huge fan of grammars that have a separate workbook. Um, it just adds a lot of cost for the students uh, as well as you know it's great for the publisher but i'm not so sure it's great for the students and and this gram this you know some of these are really helpful uh, some of them not so much this particular one because this is published by zondervan you've got kind of a similar approach with this greek grammar as what you have with mountains basics of biblical greek which is also by zondervan as well you've got this uh, it's kind of nice, it's got the hole punches, uh, you've got tear out pages. So in that sense, it's all really nice. <clears throat> to, to boot, to sort of add bonus material to this, unlike mounts, this workbook actually has the answer key in it. So you can see the, the exercises for each chapter, and then after that, you can turn the page and you can see all the answers for it. So you can grade your own work, and there's even a spot for each lesson where you can sort of talk, just write down your own observations. So if you were doing this in a classroom environment and you were gonna require the workbook, what I would be inclined to do is to get the students to do the work themselves, grade their own work, write down their summary of what they learned, what they missed, what they need to work on, and submit that to you. So then you can you don't have to do the grading of the actual uh, sentences and things, uh, but you can see what they've actually learned by doing that themselves. So I guess there's some benefit in this in a classroom environment, however, the big downside with this, I think, is that there's just simply not enough translation work. For each chapter you go through here, and not including those, those integration chapters, but for each chapter in here, 
really you're only getting eight or nine translation exercises, which I don't think is going to be enough. I think students are going to want more than that. And so I think you're probably going to be supplementing the workbook with other material to help students really get more experience with the language. Now, that may be then the, the reason to say, well, maybe we just build our own workbook. And that would be what I would probably end up doing is building my own workbook uh, that I can then give students with more exercises in it that we can spend a bit more time going through in class. The other thing about this, of course, like Mounts' Basics, a biblical Greek workbook as well, is that each chapter has passing exercises in it. And honestly, I wonder if this is one of those things that is with the digital age upon us, with great apps like Pass Greek, I wonder if this is one of those things that needs to be removed from workbooks and just left to the student to do inside one of those apps. That's certainly how I teach inside Master New Testament Greek, and it means that you don't have to make up passing and then grade it. That can all be done automatically. Now, there's downsides, and you can find out about that in the review of Pass Greek that I did uh, up here. But those are, that's again one of the things that fills the pages of the workbook that may not be necessary. So in conclusion, here's my conclusion for this grammar. This is a great grammar. It's the closest grammar that I've found to being the perfect grammar so far. I think linguistically, I really like this. I, I love the fact that it's got the two verbal aspects. It teaches that all the way through. You've got two verbal aspects, not three. I like the fact that it doesn't teach deponency. I like the way it's clearly written out. I think this is... Uh, got some really interesting, unique features about it, like those consolidation chapters, which is going to be really interesting to work through. I think the only issue to really work through in this is that first, those early couple of chapters where there's a lot of information, you'd have to have some way of sort of bringing that down just a little bit to make it a little easier for students, and I think there's ways of doing that. So this is, I think, my favorite Greek grammar right now, and I am actually, so here's the thing, the proof of a grammar is really in the teaching of that grammar. So one of the things I'm going to do is later this year, I'm actually going to teach through this and see how it goes. Um, if you're interested in how that goes, let me know in the comment section below and I'll, and I'll do a review of it again to say how this is how it went after teaching it. Um, but anyway, that's what I'm going to do later this year. I am going to go through and teach through this grammar. So if you're interested in that, get, make sure you jump on the mailing list by downloading your copy of the Roadmap to Mastery, uh, which you can get from masterntgreek.com slash roadmap. You can see a link for that in the description below as well. So if you're interested, I'd love to have you join us for that as well. Now, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, hit the notify bell, and also don't forget to hit the like button. That really helps me out as well. The other thing too is if you want to support this channel, go ahead and next to the subscribe button you'll see a join button which is to join the Master New Testament Greek Coffee Club. Inside there you get early access to the videos, basically before they, when I, when I put them up you'll get access to them. And not only that, you also get access to uh, the quarterly calls I have with scholars occasionally uh, and a number of other things as well. If you want to join it, it's about the price of a cup of coffee every month, so click the button below to join that as well. Thank you so much for watching. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, keep taking small, consistent steps toward mastery. We'll see you then.